Howdy everyone out there in twitch.tv land. This is another episode of The General's Tent bringing you your Hex TCG commentary and strategy. I am Hex Hunter Mokog and I have with me one of my good friends, Function Fail. Say hi to everyone, my friend. Hey, this is Function here and we are doing The General's Tent. Yeah. And I tell you what, it's been a, a little bit of a light news cycle for everything going on this week, but what's been a light on the news has been really good for some of the patches that they brought in last week. And even though we're a day behind, we're going to have another good patch tomorrow. So I think we've got uh, some fun stuff to talk about today. It's a little light, it's the holidays, but uh, I think we've got some really interesting things. What do you think? Yeah, I think everybody's kind of on uh, cruise control right now with it being holidays and whatnot. But uh, but yeah, I mean, the the we got a new patch coming out later this week. I think they're going to be adding a couple of cards. It's probably going to be a small one and maybe fixing some of these uh, bugs with the tournament uh, infrastructure. I really like some of the stuff that they brought out with this last patch. And hopefully I can bring up some cards that they uh, recently added. But I think the biggest thing has been the, the tournament functionality that they added. When it... Yeah, it's definitely pretty cool. It's good to see that. Uh, I didn't expect to get it this soon initially. Like, I thought we were going to be waiting a while until we actually saw the tournament functionality, so it's nice to have that in there now. Yeah, and, you know, they're really simple tournaments, and I'll pull them up here on the screen for everyone. So, for those who are unfamiliar or who have been living under a rock or uh, who just don't pay attention to the forums because sometimes nothing happens on there for a couple days, uh, they introduced tournaments in the last patch. Uh, the screen is a pretty simple screen. It tells you each of the active tournaments that is going on at a time, which we have quite a few in progress at the moment. Uh, it allows you to join, and I'm sure they'll get this linked up to a, a purchase queue. But you can jump in, you can pick a deck, and then you can jump in, uh, confirm your selection with your deck, throws you in, and you sit here waiting for your uh, eight players to jump in then unfortunately I probably just teased that person thinking oh good another player has joined and then uh, Mokog just left womp, uh, womp. but then uh, and it tells you like the formats the styles uh, kind of the status number of players all the all your basic stuff they don't have the round timer fully implemented yet but uh, hopefully they'll have that taken care of soon uh, in general it's not bad if a tournament could complete for me every once in a while yeah, I mean, the tournaments, uh, they're having trouble completing all the way just because other various bugs going on with the game are causing games to crash, and the tournament kind of gets stuck um, if a match doesn't go to completion. So that that's kind of, you know, it's cumbersome, but uh, it is what it is. One thing that I just remembered um, with all the, like, uh, patch-related stuff in the tournaments mm -hmm. is one of the things that got me initially, like, really excited about Hex is that you're going to be able to host your own tournaments and kind of like control what formats and what like you're gonna have a lot of knobs to turn or at least that's kind of what they've alluded to uh happening and i just now remember that like that's something i'm really excited for i uh, i definitely mm -hmm. want to know more about that sometime soon that'll definitely be uh well in all honesty well beyond interesting it's gonna be absolutely fantastic uh you know personally hosted guild tournaments uh going well beyond that like holding your own uh, invitational open yeah. That would be fantastic. Oh, yeah, you could even have like a, we could have a giveaway for like the general's tent that, you know, we could have like uh, six other random viewers get to do a draft with us or something like that, you know? Are you talking about a general's tent invitational? <laughs> yeah, there you go, the general's tent invitational, the, the highlight of the hex year. I am writing that down. We love giving stuff away. And invites to a tournament where you can battle function and kick my ass in drafts it seems like a fun way to go. No, that would be a lot of fun. And we could we could stream them and put the videos up on our YouTube channels and all kinds of fun stuff. Oh man, the Generous Tent's going to become the new Star City Games. There you go. Uh, Except I don't think we'll have anything to sell, and we won't have any like overly excited Evan Irwin. Hey, you know what? I can make the next Hex TCG Evan Irwin. I've got the pudgy face. I can shave my head. If people already know, my hair's probably got chopped off. Actually, I think you you probably could pull off a pretty good Evan Irwin impression. Just like you you got you got the voice for it. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, 
actually, I've been watching an awful lot of his stuff, and he's actually a really good content creator for Magic the Gathering. Uh, I mean, really, really good in what he does. Uh, they, In fact, they just recently made a token of him uh, for the Star Cities game tournament that I think seems sanctioned. You can actually use it as a token card. Well, you can use like just about any te token as token cards. Like I know going to like the card shop, there were guys that had like bikini women pictures with the numbers three three on them, and <laughs> they were allowed to play them, which is kind of I don't know. Well, that, that is it's a little risque, but for me, yay professionalism. Yeah, but, uh... throw the phone out the window. No, you can't you don't need throw a phone. Just don't stop that. You do need a phone. It's the tech age. I need, actually, I do need a new phone. Mine, mine's more, barely been working. But, uh, yeah, so, by the way, we do a webcast about hacks and, and stuff sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, they recently, you know, they've dropped patch 817. It's got the tournaments. We've talked about all that wonderfulness. Uh, they sometimes work all the way through. I know some of the content creators have been able to complete through tournaments. I haven't been able to get through one yet, which kind of makes me sad. But uh, I'll live. The ones you have played, like, how have, have you been doing in them so far? Are there um, any highlights from the tournaments you've done? So, my first three attempts at a tournament have gone, went really well. The, I went and I decided, I was like, you know what, I want to see exactly how good a Ruby Aggro Orc deck can do. And it went 2-0, 2-0, 2-1, and those would be great if they were all in the same tournament, because that means I at least would have won one. Uh, but then my uh, the fourth tournament I played with that one did not go quite so well. It, uh, it came across a Spell Shield uh, wild deck that just had a great sideboard. Uh, I mean, it, it really, it, its sideboard just, it had the perfect things to destroy the style of deck I was playing. And I, because I whooped him fast the first game, and then he crushed my face in the second game, and then the third game was uh, a knockdown drag out for the first seven turns. Uh, but then he dropped the Eternal Guardian on me on turn eight. And I'm like, shit, I don't have my Chaos Key anywhere near this. And I haven't been able to pull anything that resembles burn for the last six turns. I'm not going to be able to kill this guy. And I was just when I had enough to do lethal that next turn. It was like the Eternal Guardian comes in going, nope. You're not killing this guy. I'm like, shit. That, yeah, that's that been my experience it. with that one. So now I've been trying to get in with a uh, my uh, mono blood deck that I just want to test and I've been tinkering around with the most. Uh, not the one we're showing here. This is the uh, uh, Sapphire Blood Mill deck that's just mean. It's not the best thing in the world. It's just mean. Yeah, I've had a lot of people trying to play Mill against me in the tournaments and stuff, and I think they're probably just doing it for, like, for giggles or something, because it hasn't been very effective against me thus far, but um, I see a lot of people trying to make it work. You know, one of the things I found just uh, running the Mill deck so far is that if you keep the hand that's got uh, control and destruction right off the bat, you're going to do okay. Uh... I mean, because normally what ends up happening is you just get overwhelmed by creatures if you don't have enough uh, board control within your opening hands. Sure. Because uh, I've had games where I've had, like, perfect mill setups, and even, like, the AI will just, you know, run creature, 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 because I didn't have an extinction in hand, and I never pulled a murder or a persecute. Yeah, so, I mean, in that case, what I would say is it seems like a lot of the time that, like, because you were running mill, you actually hurt yourself. Like, you know, having the murderer persecute in some other deck with a different win condition uh, mm -hmm. is also good. But um, having, like, lacking them um, is only, is like a problem that mill has more, I guess, as well. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a uh, an issue. And, you know, I'm just toying around here so that people have something to watch while we're jibber-jabbering back and forth. But uh, one of the big things that I've noticed on it... Uh, actually kind of leads a little bit into my cards of the week. Let's pull these up so that I can speak on them fantastically. So the uh, one of the things that I faced in the tournament and normally beat my head in when I'm actually bringing it against uh, the mill deck is uh, Battle Beetle and Eternal Guardian are up on my cards of the week this time because they are what stomped the face of my uh, Mono Ruby deck. And... Uh, no, they were just and mean. 
What's the gem that you're seeing with the battle beetle that's causing you problems? Is it the spell shield one, oh, or is it, it something spell, else that's nifty? It was the spell shield gem. Most definitely the spell shield gem. Because uh, what it, what the battle beetle is, being at five, that's still an awkward uh, burn target. Because most of our burn is uh, even numbers. So you hit him for two, or you hit him for four, uh, or you hit him for six. So, you know, your burn for six is your third play of a rage fire. Uh, or you're having to put two or more cards into there, so the the battle beetle can do an awful, awful lot of damage to you. And but when you put spell shield on, you lose a lot of your ability to deal with it, unless you're running blood and you got mass board wiper running like diamond judgment with big creatures. As a mono yep. ruby deck, you're like, well, shit. <laughs> Yeah, either at that point you have to beat him in combat, which is pretty hard because he's pretty beefy, mm -hmm. or you have to yeah, have a board sweeper like you were saying. Well, that spell shield is definitely like hard to interact with, but so long as um, they make whatever creatures you're putting it on not like overwhelmingly powerful, where they're not the most like powerful creature besides the spell shield, I think mm -hmm. it's fine. Like so long as basically other creatures can interact with them and whatnot. Yeah, and I've noticed that uh, a lot of the other spell shield cards were very. What's the best way to say this? They were they used to be a lot beefier than they are in the present version of the alpha that we have, and so because yeah. uh, you know the scout used to be a two three now he's a two one, uh, the pig or the the little flyer is now a one three it doesn't do as much damage. Those ones are much easier to deal with and they're within a standard burn threshold. Yeah. Uh, so and sometimes you can get them in before uh, they come into play for their spell shield, especially the 1-3. And I think we're about to see why uh, Mill gets raffle stomped if you don't pull uh, extinctions. Um, and so, but when you put it on that battle beetle, it also gives itself evasion and the ability to fly. <laughs> so, not it, it against a ruby aggro deck, unless you're running Ash Harpy and you've got one on the field that's already attacked once, uh, that Battle Beetle is not really afraid, and even then, the Ash Harpy would have had to have attacked twice to be able to kill the Beetle from uh, yeah. coming over and swinging. So, Battle Beetle just raffle stomps over Ruby right now, and that's probably well, a good thing, because otherwise yeah, I, I win say... turn five and six. Yeah, I would say in there, like, so, I mean, yeah, if, it, if it's going that long and they're stabilized, we're like, you know... If they attack with the beetle, and that's their only troop, they're leaving themselves open. Like, mm -hmm. you should be able to respond with your own damage. And that's the way, like, at least Ruby or really aggressive decks should be able to deal with the beetle, is that they just keep swinging in regardless or do something along those lines. Um, it's a little different if, if you know, uh, your opponent is still at 20 life when they've played the battle beetle. Then yeah. that, that's really, you were doing something wrong if you got that far, I guess. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times what I would see is uh, they would end up running... But they were running uh, running deer, and I like running deer. Yeah. I, he is, he's right there for wild decks where he needs to be because he gives them the one to two turns, so essentially the one and a half turns necessary to get to this yeah, it guy. Gives, it gives you more reach. It's, it's a good effect. Like, you're not paying a card to get the life, uh, yeah. life gain, so you're not really losing out on much. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it's kind of a question of, like, what else, what other champion would be using. Um, you might use, like, the Shin Hair guy if you're trying to an onslaught or something but uh yeah. the 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 life gain is pretty good like life life gain in general is really strong right now um there's a lot of ways like for mid-range decks to kind of get out of range of the aggressive decks or kind of buy themselves some time to draw the card they need um yeah like life drain especially when it's like on a troop and they mm -hmm. have the effect um like that pegasus that's been added somewhat recently that one's yep. pretty good um, oh, I love that Pegasus. Like that. He, uh, the Pegasus vies for card of the week every time I play Diamond in a week. But uh, my other pick was the Eternal Guardian, and this one jumped on me because it was played perfectly. Uh, because they were able to bring it in uh, actually on turn 7 for their 7th resource play because uh, a turn two turns before they chlorophyllia to get ahead on the resources. So I'm about to swing for lethal my next turn, but they drop in the Eternal Guardian. And so preventing all the damage that's dealt to the champion as well as all of the other troops uh, makes a difference because you can't direct target Eternal Guardian and that 5-5 five five is a very special number. 
Yeah, I mean, you have to have like a direct removal. You'd have to have like a murder or a repel or one of those kind of spells that's at least going to just wipe them off the table. So it's a, uh, and you know, luckily you can deal damage to it directly. And if I was running blood in the deck, then I would have a chance to, to use a couple other tools against it. But when you're just running that, you know, I'm aggro Ruby. Uh, yeah. No, you 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 uh, you say thanks for the game, and then you queue up for another tournament. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So the uh, now you had a couple cards of the week and a really interesting find function. Now tell me about that a little bit. Okay, well you did remind me of something because I don't think I talked about this in our last match because I think I was right about to enter the tournament streamers. One kind of discovery I made, which turns out to be really really strong, is Warlock Inquisitor with the Ruby Gem that when it comes into play it kills a troop like that one's really good you get some like powerful effects that put your opponent in like a really weird spot where if if they're holding back kind of weak troops in their hand normally they'd play them and try to like swarm past you but because you have that one inquisitor you can pretty much kill their whole team with it and uh it is definitely quite the thorn in their side for decks that are trying to win with low defense troops oh most definitely because it comes in and when it enters play it deals damage equal to its attack to a random opposing troop yeah, so it does like three damage to a random opposing troop, which is, uh, I mean, it, it kills a lot of stuff. Sure, it's not going to kill everything. So I was kind of sideboarding it in a lot, and it did pretty well for me. Um, but yeah, that. So, but back to my cards of the week. My mm -hmm. cards of the week here, um, I, well, I, I think I've probably talked about both of them at some point on this episode, on this show, and they're back. So that's just too bad because I found some funny interactions with them and I figured I'd share it with everybody. This was actually discovered in the middle of like an eight man tournament queue. Um, my opponent was playing an Inspire deck. Now that Blessing of the Fallen is actually working, I see a lot of people playing Inspire and it's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Like it's actually, you know, it has some interesting plays. I, at first, I kind of wrote it off as maybe it, it being like too reliant on synergy, mm -hmm. but uh, Blessing does quite a bit for the deck. And what's interesting is I was playing Uranaz. And what he does is when he comes into play, he takes a troop from your opponent's graveyard and puts it into play under your own control. You know, so he has to actually enter play and then the, the trigger takes effect. And it's pretty good. You get, you're get you getting free value. Um, even if they immediately kill your Uranaz, you're still at least getting a troop out of it um, from your opponent. And you can usually yep. take their best one. So hopefully you're getting something pretty good. In this case, I played it and I grabbed their Lord Alexander. And what's kind of interesting is Inspire is supposed to like inspire troops as they come into play, but for whatever reason, Inspire triggered for Urunaz, even though he was already in play, the mm -hmm. Lord Alexander saw him come in and it gave him speed. And Urunaz could have swung in and stolen another guy that turn, but unfortunately I didn't know that that was gonna happen. It was already my second main phase. Otherwise mm -hmm. I would have been able to do all kinds of stuff there. That would have been pretty powerful. Oh, that would have been, oh, super rough right there. So the so you dropped your Nas in on your second main phase, and then you noticed that you were given the, uh, the speed, speed token yeah. on Urnaz. So yeah. now, because we know Urnaz looks like it hits play, and then its effect hits the stack, which then allows you to go search for a card. So that kind of bug tells you that there's either something that's persistent there that we're not seeing on the surface, or yeah. it's transposing the F Inspire effect before Uranaz hits the in-place state before yeah, Lord so Alexander. What what it's working as effectively is that his uh, when he comes into play in magic terms is mm -hmm. instead being uh, in game, mechanically what we're seeing it as is instead of when it's doing as he enters play. And mm -hmm. there is a distinction there um, with cards like if it says as, it means that it happens at the same time that whatever the, the following statement occurs. And in this case, um, it says when. So it's supposed to take place like the when, and then the second thing happens after that. But currently, they're both happening simultaneously, which is kind of uh, yeah. interesting. And I can confirm that it happens with stuff other than Lord Alexander. Like all the Inspire guys work with him so far that I've seen because he was getting buffed from other stuff um, with when he came into play initially. And that was it was pretty cool. So the. Uh... And I guess it really does come to the win versus as on the rules because if they have one part of the trigger, because they'll both function to a programmer about the same. Uranaz hits the board. Uranaz sends trigger out for effect to pull a card from the graveyard, pull it into play, 
and then they go, okay, does this trigger the Inspire effect or not? And that's just a toggle, does it do it, does it not, sort of a yeah. statement. It, exactly. So maybe the stack's not clearing all the way. Um, but yeah, either way, uh, Urunas and or the Inspire troops are both seeing each other come mm -hmm. into play, which is a... Uh, which, at least the way the cards are worded, isn't the way it's supposed to be. It might be intentional, and maybe the cards are just worded wrong. But it's definitely mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty powerful thing. And so those are my cards of the week, is Urunaz and Lord Alexander, because they're, they're, they're the best frenemies. <laughs> well, they also got some hilarious flavor, too. The fallen hero from the Inspire deck is taken over by the blood dragon Urunaz. Watch as the town cowers in fear from the frightful feast that is played upon the deadly dragon yeah it definitely backfires on him a little bit <laughs> the uh oh you thought sending a champion against one of the uh deepest and darkest fiends of entrath was a good idea no courage just got you killed sir <laughs> so uh what were we talking about we were talking about some of the patch changes and stuff mm -hmm. added recently we talked about cards of the week i think uh you know the forums have been pretty dead the last couple of weeks there hasn't been as much activity um, but one thing a lot of people were talking about is the metagame and yep. whether it's healthy and whether there's a couple cards in it that are stifling the metagame. Um, so before we get into what other people were saying, do you have any uh, particular opinions on this initially? Um, I have not felt stifled in my games yet. And for those who may not see them, I have a lot of different types of decks I like running around with. I've not seen anything just be flat out overpowering. Uh, each of the decks has at least a 50% win ratio, even some of my really crazy decks. Uh, it seems diverse now, tournament-wise. Uh, I'll need to get to round two in more tournaments uh, to really make that sort of call. Sure. So, uh, as far as it comes to the metagame, I mean, it's still an alpha metagame. People are still playing around. Not everyone, everyone's using fun decks. And some are using some uh, well-tuned decks, especially with well-tuned uh, reserve sideboards. So everyone's still trying things out. Do I see anything oppressive? Um, no, uh, I haven't seen anything that I just went, oh my goodness, throw my hands up in the air now. I mean, because yeah. you know, any most of the times I lose, it's because either I didn't mulligan to set myself up well with the deck I was using, or. Uh, there was a misplay or they just got a fantastic draw on their deck did everything it was supposed to do you know the standard stuff for when you lose that makes sense but yeah uh, exactly you know the funnest things I've had are cerebral fulminations have not been bugging out so whenever I get an aggro deck against a blood control deck they're just like blood is like yeah give me free cards I don't have to pay two life for Sure. Yeah, no, I definitely, I've had somebody play Cerebral against me too, and when I was playing a Blood deck, I was like, hey, this is working out pretty nice. I like not losing life when I draw cards. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, some a lot of people were mentioning um, two cards in particular, both Blood, uh, by coincidence, and they were Extinction and Life Siphon. And uh -huh. I, I definitely have some, some opinions about each. I would say Life Siphon, while being a powerful card, I don't think it's stifling by any means, because um, there's a lot of powerful cards in the game, and uh, I think a lot of people might be um, reluctant to have powerful spells in the game. I think uh, on the surface, I think the casual player at least is going to prefer the powerful cards to be troops. But I think mm -hmm. it's totally fine and it's good for the game to have powerful troops and powerful spells. And so, I mean, these are two of the more powerful spells in the game. And I think they're in a pretty safe spot. Life Siphon, you can top deck it and get a win, but mm -hmm. you can top deck a lot of cards and, and get a win off of them. Um, and it does you take a big investment. You can get blown out really easy with Life Siphon. If your opponent's playing a Stone Skin, or if you're playing one yourself yep. to block uh, a Life Siphon, that can be really powerful. Um, and just like, it does powerful things. It helps you kind of buy an extra turn sometimes or get through some extra damage. But um, a lot of cards do that. And I, I don't think it's really in an unsafe uh, spot right now. And as for Extinction, I think, um, you know, it exists, and there are some decks that Extinction's going to be really, really good against, like especially mm. Shin Hair decks. I think it'll be really strong against um, Inspire decks, actually, not so much because Blessing of the Fallen still gets a lot of work in yep. if your opponent plays kind of around the Extinction and is smart about what they do. Mm -hmm. um, but Extinction on its own, like, it does have a, a stifling effect against some types of decks, but I don't think it does so in an unhealthy way, so long as there's 
a wide enough variety of decks that Extinction isn't getting mm -hmm. played in every single one. And even every single Blood deck isn't playing Extinction necessarily. I know I wasn't main decking it um, through the tournament, and I think that was a pretty safe call for the type of deck I had built. Um, I brought it in sometimes, but not all the time by any means. Well, and there's a... I think it's one of those where it's the concept of how powerful Board Wipe is on the game. Board Wipe is powerful in this game. Hands down, end of the story. It is a game-defining mechanic. Uh, yeah. Board Wipe hits down. You you know, you've been building up playing your creature a turn. You've only got two cards in your hand. And then all of a sudden, whoop! All, all your combat tricks are useless and you have uh, a shard in hand. Uh, but that is overplaying and overextending your position. And it's one of those things of right now we have board wipe. It's yeah. going to be, it's there, you have to play around it. Because Ruby has board wipe for almost anything with two health or less through Heat Wave. Uh, Blood has multiple forms of board wipe in uh, Extinction and Sorrow for all of your one cost weenies, which I argue is the general shin hair murderer when they're not set up. Uh, once they're set up, you need Extinction, but. Uh, you can murder a whole bunch of zero one rabbits they're pretty quick with one sorrow yeah uh, so it's there it's what gives blood its power but the other side is blood has you know only a couple decent mid-range cards uh, yeah I and mean, it, a lot of it, those it, can be comboy on top of that yeah so i think um with with blood what i would say in in the case of extinction is there is a possibility like it raising its cost to five might be better with you know um, in Magic, you see a lot of wipes be at the four cost, but mm -hmm. right at set one, um, without like kind of everything having room to breathe, it being at five might be fine, um, but it being at four also seems fine. I think the biggest thing that I would like to see though is decks that Extinction is good in against, I would like to see them still have options that give them reach past that. Like, they don't get blown out so hard. So some mm -hmm. of that's going to be the way you play. But then we also haven't seen cards like Inferno, um, where an aggressive Ruby deck can play at post-extinction or before yep. extinction and still be getting in a pretty decent amount of damage. Um, that'll help. Like, the key with extinction is you want to still keep... if. If you're playing against it, you want to keep your opponent like they're backed against the wall, so that mm -hmm. even after extinction, you still have pressure on them. If you're not putting any pressure on your opponent, you're probably going to lose regardless of whether you had they had extinction or not, just because you're kind of doing something clunky and not very effective. And I think that's that's where maybe some newer and more casual players aren't quite understanding that aspect. Maybe I can definitely see that. So just as a uh, in some of my playtesting running the uh, the orc aggro deck uh you know if i have a field of savage raiders and a zoltog in play with one zoltog in hand i'm okay if you just extinctioned because next turn i'm going to play another zoltog and rinse lather repeat but that's because yeah. i didn't overextend and play out everything plus you know just because zoltog's unique you don't want to have two in play but you know you don't need two zoltogs having the second one and there's greedy and so you, the extinction punishes you for being greedy uh, I can yeah. see sapphire flight decks getting real greedy real quick especially with the the prolificacy of you know wanting to drop every single one of your ancestors chosen as early as possible to fill up your deck with specters uh, well that's when a sorrow is supposed to be played that's when an extinction is supposed to be played because you're getting greedy and well yeah. no one likes to be chastised but even those like ancestor chosen decks, like once they've put a lot of specters in their deck, they have a good way to come back from extinction. Like they could still draw mm -hmm. a whole bunch of them, chain them together, and what do you know? Like the turn after extinction, they could plop down uh, three specters and still have a bunch of cards in their hand. So I mean, um, yeah. those are the kinds of reach, I guess, is what I'm talking about. It's like there should be ways to interact with um, most decks. Like having non-interactive stuff um, isn't good, and I'm not really seeing a whole lot of that right now. Um, I, I don't think extinction's overpowering by any means, um, and there's yeah. definitely there's a lot of room for aggro. People were saying that maybe there wasn't a lot of aggro in the streamers tournament, but I think there was still room for it. It just people didn't happen to be playing it. Like so, Inspire is definitely pretty good, um, and Wild Ruby aggro has a lot of potential to just like mm -hmm. you know some of its hands will win very quickly in the game. 
but it actually has a lot of those hands. It's not just like one or two hands are god draws. It's actually got quite a few very, very aggressive draws where it can close out the game on turn four or five without too much trouble. Yeah, Ruby or the Ruby Wild combos and Wild in general is it's lovely. I love playing Wild. And my uh, most savage beating in a tournament was done by a, a wild, a mono wild deck. So, you know, and then I love seeing that Inspire looks like it's coming back because it was it looks so fabulous during the Gen Con decks. It was doing yeah, really well. Yeah, it was well. really good at Gen Con. Yeah, at Gen Con, it was. I think most people agreed that it was the strongest one. It was either that one or the Mono Ruby one were the strongest. They were both very very powerful. And you know, a lot of people were poo pooing Diamond, and some people were not all that. Uh, uh, you know, really keen on the blood deck either, but now we see that you know the power of life siphon and extinction are now getting a little bit whined about, and you know things are shifting around. And it's it's yeah. what it ends up being that example of is a design concept called imperfect balance. So they want things to shift around. So if yeah. if two decks look like they're rocking the tournament scene, they want another deck that'll come in and shift one or both of those out and keep it rotating around within a single set. And exactly. the set's big enough that they can do that and keep the metagame flowing from tournament to tournament to tournament. So in a single tournament, you might have the wild deck just you know be able to drop down uh, Fist of Brigadon turn three you know, in a couple of its matches on the way up and its spell shield just rock face. But then, you know, the next time that deck goes into the other tournament, someone brought their blood deck with, you know, extinctions and destruction with chaos keys, and it just blows it away and drops it out that time. And as sure. long as that happens, everything's cool. And then maybe one bright, shiny day, the mill deck wins a tournament, and everyone goes, <laughs> Mill's broken! Oh my god, Mill won a tournament! Yeah, it's never supposed to win a tournament. Means, no. Mill OP, um, Mill OP. So yeah, I mean, like, you know, Inner Conflict's a card that's really good against Fist, like you were saying. And, you know, if if all of a sudden, like, nobody's playing Mono Wild and maybe Inner Conflict isn't nearly as good against mm -hmm. um, the rest of the field, but it, it which it, it actually is pretty good against the rest of the field, um, just depends on what you're expecting to play against. But say, you know, fewer people are playing Inner Conflict, well, then all of a sudden Fist uh, becomes pretty good. And, yeah, that might yep. be a good choice. And like you are saying, you know, metagame shift. As long as there's uh, ways to prey on the top decks ways to uh, kind of um, exploit their weaknesses, uh, mm -hmm. there will always be a, a strong metagame that you can kind of shift around and see what's what's currently the best that day. And you know, one of the shifts that we've already seen in the metagame came with how they uh, treated Escalation cards now. Uh, I see a lot less complaints about Escalation cards. Yeah, uh, Escalation I tried cards looking feel for a pretty it. healthy spot. The, uh, which is good, because I think, like we were saying a, a couple episodes before, they really like the turn one plays on all of them. They love the turn two plays on each one. If you notice, those are the same. It was the turn three, they're like, you know, that might be a little broke. And they're like, turn four should be game ending. And now it's the turn five, maybe the turn six play of an escalation is game ending, depending on which one it is. Yeah. But uh, I've noticed they haven't fallen out of favor, but they're not appearing as kill scenarios as much anymore. I don't fear Crash of Beast as much as I used to. I'll be honest, I don't fear the Rage Fire anymore. Um, I yeah. used to fear the Rage Fire. Well, what was funny before is like, um, regardless of which Inspire or Escalation card, and granted, uh, Relentless Corruption wasn't in the game yet um, mm -hmm. at this point when I'm talking about it, so it was just uh, everything except for the Blood Escalation, but at one point it was, regardless of what, uh, or whatever color you're playing, you're including four copies of every Escalation card that you can fit in within your colors for that deck. Like, mm -hmm. even if you're not milling them, the Chronic Madness was would kill them so quickly due to the mill that a lot of times it was a good choice. Sure, that one wasn't in every single deck, but like Ragefire, if you're playing Ruby, it was a guaranteed four of. Like, there was no mm -hmm. time you would ever want to play Ruby and not play Ragefire. And, I, and actually, in that case, I expect that'll be true for quite a while, is that um, Rage Fire will always be wanted for Ruby just because it offers something that um, it really needs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't think that the Escalation cards are going to be auto-includes in every single deck that plays those colors. Um, 
you know, for forever now because of it. Because before they were going to scale so good, especially as more sets came out and you had ways to filter through your deck. Yeah, they were going to be strong. Now the uh, now one of the things I've really started liking uh, is Relentless Corruption as the uh, escalation goes. Because uh, that first play seems really, really slow for the three mana cost. But once you get to your turn two and your turn three plays of them, it's just been fantastic to steal anything from my opponent. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, and I'll be honest, in some cases it's one. Uh, you steal your opponent's resource that they uh, were absolutely needing and you block them entirely out of their threshold. That's uh, the Relentless Corruption in action there. Uh, well, the thing with Relentless Corruption is, I would say, is it's good when you think the cards in your opponent's deck are better than yours on average. Like, um, there's a point at which, you know, Relentless Corruption, you would rather just draw one of your own cards from your own deck than one from your opponent's. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, it's funny, because there's weird times with Corruption where the only card that can possibly win you like, the, the only out you have is playing Relentless Corruption and drawing the one card you need from your opponent's deck. Like, you don't have any outs in your deck, but they have mm -hmm. some in theirs. And it's happened to me once or twice where I play Corruption, I'm like, oh, there's the card I was looking for. And you're like, <laughs> win, yay. But uh, mm -hmm. overall, um, it it's not nearly as strong as the other ones just because um, not every deck is going to want it in quite the same way. Because it, it's not that great against, like, really aggressive early decks because you know getting a savage raider rather than a card from your own deck isn't necessarily probably what you want to be doing and that i definitely agree on that one what i found that it really seems to affect the most has been uh two threshold decks so if you happen to relentless corruption turn three and you pull the resource they're needing or you pull the shards of fate or you pull their fixer and they happen to be holding most of one shard that they were just wanting to get that next one on it I it's shut down players before, uh, and especially when you take and play that shard, you're like, oh, I needed a diamond. Oh, look, I drew your diamond. Thank you. Yeah, I, that 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 I, that won't happen quite as often as as uh, it may seem. Sure, it'll happen every once in a while, and you'll actually totally win the game off of mm -hmm. it. But other times, you know, drawing that shard, um, maybe the next card on the top of their deck was also a shard, and they only wanted to draw one and not two. So sometimes, in that case drawing the shard off their deck is helping them more than it's helping you um mm -hmm. but it's and, not a bad thing you know and uh, you know that's actually one of the fun parts about mill and that i've been uh really debating with myself watching the mill deck play out because i love testing my mill deck is you're not sure whether or not you want to discard the card sometimes because <laughs> uh, you're like wow i just discarded eight resources in a row did i really want to do that well, you know, you didn't really have any control over what you were going to hit, so whether you wanted to do it or not is kind of irrelevant. But uh, it, it is does irrelevant. give you a sad face when it when it yes. does happen. But then I've had uh, other times where I turned one Chronic Madness and I saw things like Fist of Brigadon, Chlorophylia, and Howling Brave go all in one go, and I'm like, I just saved myself the game. I feel proud. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Getting hitting those three cards is definitely a pretty live the dream scenario where they are going to just have the god draw and. At least uh, you rained on their parade a little bit. The, uh, it's definitely... Mill's going to be around, and I'm glad that it's going to be around, and I think it's going to be a troll deck. And it's going to be a delicious yeah. troll deck, and you'll you'll probably see me and a few others just running it around the Proving Grounds, just raining on people's day. I want it to be there enough to where all I can have to do is run a Sapphire Flight deck with the Mill Hero, to totally throw off my opponent in a tournament i want that to be a thing because the last thing you know i want them to be prepared to be discarding their cards and waiting for the chronic madness and waiting for the twisted fate and waiting for the crazy combo and then all of a sudden you go uh you know turn two you drop down uh your aerial combat and i think that's it but you drop down air uh, superiority, air superiority yeah. and then you're like Rage bird, rage bird, rage bird, rage bird, uh, all sorts of fun stuff. And they're like, "But I thought this was a mill deck." And you're like, "No, sapphire aggro, boom." Yeah, I mean, like, how how much are you losing out by not playing a champion that actually benefited your deck, though? You know, well, you it, might not it, be losing. It it, it it does. It's deck to deck sort of thing. But uh, one of the things yeah. you think about sapphire flight, you have a couple different ways you can run that champion. If it's a really aggressive sapphire flight. 
Maybe you don't need your champion. Maybe you just need that yeah. little bit of disruption on your second shard play to make them think that things are going wrong. Yeah, because you definitely play differently against Mill than how you would play against an aggro deck, and you might cause your opponent to kind of get oh, yeah. in a different head state. Sure, It's the mulligans. It's actually, I think, where it hits them the most, because you're willing to mulligan differently against a Mill deck. You might keep a five-shard hand against a, a Mill deck thinking, I know I'm going to need my resources. Most of the time, they're going to hit my resources probably when I need them. Maybe I'll keep this hand, or okay, I've got a one-shard hand, I've got 26 shards in the deck, I'm statistically likely to draw shards here, maybe I'll keep this one. And, you know, turn two, I, you know, used my champion's mill power, and turn three, flight is coming down out of my ears, and they're like, <laughs> what just happened? Sure. Now, if um... you can reserve a champion, that would be amazing, Cryptozoic. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Yeah, I definitely like the idea of being able to reserve champions in the sideboard, like, or being able to swap them out between games. Um, mm -hmm. There's, I would say, like, you know, probably 90% of the games you're going to play, um, it's not even going to be something that you want to consider, but there's going to be some decks where, you know, swapping from one champion to another is actually pretty good for them. Like, I've been playing Cranach, the guy who you pay two life and you draw. Yep. And maybe that's a liability. If you're playing against a really, really fast, aggressive deck, maybe you just can't afford to lose two life. And maybe you don't really need the card, but then you switch to, like, Gozog, and you can gain yep. some life instead that way or something. Uh, Blood can do it right now with those two, most definitely. In fact, I think the Flight deck can do it, too, if you're running a, uh, I would say, a Spell Shield Flight deck. So a uh, Sapphire Wild deck. Maybe you want... Uh, feather drifting down river, river in one and you want running deer in the other because you've got a lot of good synergies uh, with the Coyotal. Uh, sure. And a couple of the artifact ones. So maybe you find that you need a lot more late game beats and you're running a uh, Ruby Sapphire artifact deck. Alright, so what if I want Farney this one game and I want my worker bot creator uh, Bertram the other game? So, yeah, it'd be interesting to be able to keep your options open. I'm not sure how they'd implement it. Um, on their end, but at least it's an interesting idea. We'll see what, what ends up happening. Yeah, looking at the uh, the interface on it, which I'd love to jump in and show beat someone in right there in the middle of a tournament, but that's going to be highly unlikely at this point. But uh, it really does not seem to show the ability to switch out champions at all. It doesn't look like they want to implement it at the moment because there's yeah. not a space for it. They haven't put anything on the UI that looks like it could be there. Uh, I don't. I don't think we'll actually ever see it. I think, like, if I just my gut instinct is mm -hmm. just gonna be like, well, you know, that's just a a choice you're making is that yep. you're gonna be stuck with that champion. So, um, you know, it's it's fine for some choices to be semi permanent or at least permanent for the course of the tournament. Um, you know, not everything needs to be super flexible. And uh, you know, aggro decks, they're gonna. There's probably for whatever uh, shard they're playing, there's probably gonna be the the best possible champion for that deck. And they're mm -hmm. not going to ever want it. So you know, some some decks are going to benefit more popping than others, and I think it's fine if they just leave it as is. Although it's an interesting idea. Now it'll be interesting if they uh, think about implementing the system once they start having a uh, what is it? It's the oh goodness, it's with the keeps. Do you remember what they called it? Um, keep defense is that what you're yes, keep defense. So it's an interesting choice on keep defense. Would you have one champion? taking all three decks or maybe will you have a mercenary for each deck defending your keep uh you can get real fun with uh keep defense and mercenaries and maybe a reserve style system for defending your keep as well yeah i'm really looking forward to keep defense keep defense looks like it's going to be really cool i i can't wait for that to be in game because i mean that's way down the line but uh mm -hmm. that's something that definitely has me pretty excited and which is good because you know initially I was only really excited about the the PvP aspect and drafting and stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm glad that they can get me excited about some other stuff that I don't think I would normally would be. Well, and you know I think the because there's two parts to keep defense. So the one great part about keep defense is you're essentially designing your own dungeon without a lot of the UI enhancements that you would want in there sure. without the backgrounds or the screens. You know, you designed your own little keep background that they you know prefabbed for you, and you got three decks. You know, that's a little mini dungeon uh, challenge that they have essentially outsourced to all of their players. Hells yeah, you have just crowdsourced dungeon making. Good yeah. job, Cryptozoic. Uh, 
And then the other one they had was allowing your PvE players to essentially transform themselves into raid bosses. So yeah. that is then world PvE raid bosses being controlled by a player. So it's that quasi-PvE slash PvP hybrid idea that I want them to be able to implement too. Yeah, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff with Hex. Because I tell you what, I, I love the idea of being able to create a mill, a mass mill deck. Think about that function. A mass mill deck. You mean like hitting multiple opponents at once? Yes. So you have, because in a raid, you've got three players versus one. So you have three PvE players trying to take on my, you know, my deck as the, the raid boss, and I am playing out a mill deck against them. And so they're throwing everything out there. I'm using some PvP cards because Extinction's amazing and Sorrow's probably going to be amazing against 1-1s. One and I've yep. got, you know, all this gear on the champion that I'm running with it. And I'm just like, mill, 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 mill. I'll call it the think, farmer deck. I think if there's one um, one lesson to be learned from this episode of the General's Tent, it's that Mokog okay. really, really, really likes, likes mill. mill. I do. It's it's terrible. And there, oh, there's a story behind it, too. Uh, I've got a minute. I'll tell the story. So one of the games I used to play uh, before coming over to Hex was a game called Magi Nation. And it was a deck, or its deck design allowed you to never mill yourself. Whenever you would come to the end of your deck at the start of your next or draw phase, you would just shuffle your deck back up and then draw again because they, the way that they did their design you had three uh, characters like champions and they fought one after another and you had one match one match games because ideally you took your deck you ran it through three different characters and uh, pretty well decided the power of a deck so what you could do with that and some of the things that got really really broken in that game were you could draw through your deck when it was already a shorter deck on top of it you could draw through 40 cards in a turn picking and choosing Crazy. the things you wanted to keep by the end of your turn you lost your first character but your second turn second character had everything they needed in their hand and replenished on the resources you're like play amazing play amazing play amazing completely turn the tide on turn two or turn three and you're like that's kind of cool awesome uh and so but see that's the self mill side of it so I think about it yeah. like now I'm going to do it in reverse I'm going to draw through your deck draw through your deck draw through your deck and that's why I like Relentless Corruption and Twisted Fate. I should get a boost from drawing from your deck. Which I yep. think used to work, but doesn't anymore, and I'm now kind of sad. What was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I, I like that. At least uh, that story with the, the other game. Um, what were you going to say? Uh, so I think we're kind of... Oh, I was going to say one other um, feature that I kind of would like added. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're kind of doing a lot of cosmetic changes with the new patches, which yep. is good to see that they're kind of uh, branching out and being able to cover some more bases and stuff. It's a good sign as far as development goes. But um, one thing I would like to be able to do is be able to click and drag cards, like as if you're making piles of cards like in real life and, and be able to kind of arrange things rather than just like, move this deck this card to this deck kind of just have like a free form deck building mode i would uh, i would like that i think that would be pretty cool yeah they really have it much more like a uh, a regimented sorting style that's here you can't just be like i i want cards in this pile over here or cards in that pile over there yeah uh ooh large card view mode yeah i mean cuz you can uh you can't really move them around in your uh deck itself that might be an interesting feature to enable, like have it be one of the little the tabs, right there, and it'd be like enable freeform mode or non snapping yeah. mode. Exactly, because like at least when I'm building decks with like physical cards, I always have like I'll be making piles and moving them around in mm -hmm. that way, and it kind of like helps you organize things in your mind yep. a little bit more mentally and everything. Um, I kind of, like, I would like that because that's just the way I, I build decks. It's like, yeah, I want all my creatures on this side, and I want all my spells on the left, and I want uh, in this bottom row all my resources so I can see them out, and maybe I think of resources in terms of four resources, so I want four here, four here, four here. Uh, yeah, or, or like you have a pile of cards you definitely want in the deck, a pile of cards that might make the deck, a, mm -hmm. a pile of cards that like you're only going to include one of these, so you got to figure that out later kind of thing. Um, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, uh, hey Shaggy, if you happen to be uh, in the chat today, take that one back to the development team. I'll tweet it out to you too. Because, uh, yeah. you know, just having a non-snap mode in there gives it a little bit more of an organic feel. 
And then, exactly. you know, all you have to do is just, you know, click back to, you know, maybe click back to large card view or maybe like list mode and it snaps everything back into place. Yeah, that'd be really nifty. I would like that. I think it'd be pretty cool. But uh, so now, why don't we do our, our community spotlight? Yes, actually, one of the one of the early uh, content creators, uh, great guy. He's been on the forums for a while. Hex TCG Shuffle, also known as Hyena Nipples on the forums. Uh, he's been doing really great puzzles and articles. Uh, he's done a couple different interviews as well. He's done. I think he's also done some artist interviews. He has just been a, a fantastic contributor. Uh, so if you have a spare moment or two, head to hextcgshuffle.com. Uh, he's got a great uh, WordPress style set up there. Easy to follow through. He's got some fun stuff on there too. I mean, he's tried doing some creative writing for Hex. Uh, he, I remember one of the first things he tried doing was a uh, try your own adventure or build your own. Uh, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, your I own adventure that. style. And uh, I remember reading through that one time. It's like, all right, well, I choose to jump out the window onto the blacksmith's house. You meet a shin hair. He stabs you. Damn it! Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I wanted cool. to I pick that. up the sword. And apparently, I was supposed to run instead of pick up the sword. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, I forgot that that was in there. But, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. I like that. So, he's, you know, he's a decent writer. He's been really good about keeping up with the content, writing fantastic articles. He deserves some community spotlight love. Go out and check him out. Yeah, he's definitely doing a better job than uh, than me about uh, keeping up my routine. Hey, gotta you got an article up on uh, Hex Vault on Hex the Vault, 6th. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I did toss up a, a, an article earlier this month, and I actually need to kind of write an update to that article. Cause that deck, I did a deck tech in the Hex Vault article, mm -hmm. and um, the the deck is very similar to one I ended up playing in the Tournament of Streamers, but it changed quite a bit since I wrote the article. And actually, it turned out to be a pretty good deck. Um, so I'll have to update that for people if they want to see it in use a little bit more, maybe. Well, you know what? You have a perfect opportunity with the Tournament of Streamers knowledge that you've got with you to do an update. And maybe in the next couple of days, you can do another update for Hex Vault. Yeah, there we go. I think that sounds like a good idea. I gotta do that. I think actually, well, for what it's worth, work has been very busy the month of mm -hmm. December. But uh, for me, at least, um, my New Year's resolution is to get get back on the horse as far as content creation goes and get back into the routine of doing everything. I most definitely agree. I've had a, I've been probably pulling forty five hour weeks on top of trying to get into streaming and following up everything that's going on with the streamers tournament and. Oh, goodness, it's exhausting, but it's fun. Yeah. Uh, no, totally. You know, these decks don't test themselves, everyone. It, <laughs> no. it, it takes a special brand of fail to do what I do. <laughs> That's right. All right, so we're coming to the end of our time today. Uh, if y'all have any questions, if y'all want us to take a look at any specific cards, maybe you've got a deck you'd like to have tuned, I will throw this right at Function be like, hey, Function, make this deck better, and maybe we'll play it. Uh, yeah, that would be fun. If if people have ideas for like decks they want to see us uh, take a look at and see what how maybe we might interpret those decks, um, definitely send them our way, because I, I would like to do that, and that'd be fun. It's just we actually need uh, listener support on that one. We need people to actually submit the decks for us to do. Yes, and if... Uh... You know, if you find that you may not be free on the evenings when we do the General's Tent, we also have these going up on my YouTube channel, uh, Hex Hunter Mokog. You know, so YouTube uh, forward slash Hex Hunter Mokog. Uh, I try to get these up within a week. This last one was a little bit longer, but I got it saved in time so we didn't lose it to the Twitch world. Uh, the Twitch Nether. Oh, that's a scary place to Twitch Nether where uh, unsaved videos go to perish. But uh, Yeah, it's like the elephant graveyard of, of videos. Yes. Of hard work. Oh my goodness. It, it, it really is. If you don't pull something down from Twitch fast enough, it just goes poof. But uh, in some cases, I'm glad because there's some really bad games I've streamed that I'm like, I'm glad this is not going to survive. Yeah, you're like, I don't ever want to see somebody let anybody know that I was playing that. They should only know that I was playing Milpex. <laughs> Your yes. super secret tech won't be spoiled. Correct which is uh, why you never see me actually playing my mono blood deck. That's got to be a tournament surprise there out go. there because it's, yeah. it's a mill blood deck. Eh, eh, no, it doesn't exist yet. You can't play Chronic Madness often enough for that. Wait. Shh. You can find or a way to do it. I? Uh, but enough fun. 
Uh, thanks everyone for watching. If y'all have any uh, comments, thoughts, ideas, maybe things you'd like us to discuss or argue about, because I'm more than willing to to hurl uh, arguments over at Function over there, and he's more than willing to call me stupid. It's happened once before. Yeah, we're gonna start before. the fisticuffs. Yes, fisticuffs. Hey, maybe maybe we even uh, talk him into finally getting a webcam up. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll try to. I think uh, after this holiday is over, I'll 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 go out and get one if I haven't gotten one already. Alrighty, but until then, thanks for tuning in to the General's Tent, your source for Hex TCG comedy, yes, and commentary. Freudian slip there. <laughs> That's good. I commentary like that. and strategy. No, I think uh, comedy <laughs> and commentary is pretty good. <laughs> Comedic commentary and strategy from Hex Hunter Mokog and Function Fails. The question is, who is the true fails? I don't know about that one, but I, I like the first one. All right. Again, everyone, thanks for watching. Y'all have a great evening. Cheers.